Well, so great to be here with you today. And uh, what makes it even more special is seeing these membership, these new guys coming into church membership. Let's give them a round of applause again. And as I listened to the verses being read out, I suddenly realized we, we serve an awesome God because most of those verses are in my sermon today. And it just reaffirms that this message, as Errol was saying, is, 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 is ready for us today. This message is ready for each and every one of us sitting here. And I love church family. Don't you love church family? I love it. I love it when I see these people getting up. I love it that these people are, are committing to serving, to fellowshipping, to getting stuck in, as we say. And uh, it's not going to be easy. Who, whose family in, at home is easy? Raise your hands if your family is easy. It's a joy and always a pleasure. Plain sailing. No, nothing ever problems, no issues. Things just happen. Not your family. Maybe it's just my family. But your family as well. It's not so easy. There's, there's troubled times. There's hard talks. There's difficult discussions. Sometimes it's uncomfortable. Who's had some of those uncomfortable talks with dad? Those are uncomfortable talks, aren't they? Life's not easy, and uh, we're going to go through these ups and downs, and, and, and there's, there's Christian brothers and sisters, and, and that's the beauty about family. It doesn't matter what my earthly sister says or does or does whatever. She's going to be my sister forever. I can't divorce her. She's always my sister. I can't run away from her. She's going to always be my sister. And that's the same with this church family. And, and, and I get so mad sometimes when I hear people bad-mouthing the church. And I'm not talking about this church. I'm not talking about uh, other churches. I'm talking about the church, the global church. And, and I have this sense of feeling sometimes that sometimes God is, God's got an incredible sense of humor. Who, who, who agrees with me? God has a sense of humor. Well, I'm glad you think he has a sense of humor. I know he's got a sense of humor. And sometimes I think that uh, the sense of humor is going to be so great that, you know, think of that Christian that really gets on your nerves right now. Think, think of that, Oak. Think of the person that really just, you know, irritates you to the next level. Um, don't be all holier than thou. You, everyone's got that person. You don't have to like them. You just have to love them. Isn't that what we heard a few, few weeks ago? Now, I think God's incredible sense of humor is going to be at the great banquet. He's putting you, that person at your table. I think he's going to put you, and even worse than that, your, your mansion, your, your, your home, I think might be next door to him. But too many of us, we run away, don't we? We, we don't want to deal with it here. And uh, well, we've got all eternity to sort those problems out, so something to look forward to. But, but I really can't stand the bad mouthing. I don't know, it just really, it really hurts me. And uh, one of the happiest days of my life was when I stood at the front, 13 years ago, almost 13 years ago, yeah, 13 years. I stood at the front of a church in Lake Eland and watched my bride come, come down that aisle. And imagine what I would have felt if the people that were there in the audience were bad mouthing. We were laughing, we were ridiculing, we were skinnering. As me, the groom, stood there watching my bride come down that aisle. And, and I feel that that's what Jesus is doing right now. He's sitting up front there and, he, and, he's, and the bridegroom's coming. And the music has started. And uh, we're so busy fighting amongst ourselves, our own brothers and sisters, we're not focused on Jesus. And, uh, and, it, and it bleeds out into our church, doesn't it? We have such demands on our, on our church, on our local church. Everything in church should be designed to meet my needs, isn't it? That's what we come here for. That, that if you don't get something out of everything that goes on, then it's not right, we shouldn't support it. We have to start realizing that I'm, I'm not the only one with needs. Our pastors have needs. My kids, I have needs. My kids have needs. The community has needs. The old uncles and aunties have needs. The ones hard of hearing have needs. The one who say that the music is too loud has needs. We all have needs, but 
we get so focused on ourselves, and we forget that the church is designed for everyone and to primarily meet the needs of the unsaved. Do you realize that? It's primarily met, meant to meet the needs of the unsaved. So, where does that leave us? Where does that leave us? And uh, love comes to mind. Remember, we don't have to like them, we just have to love them. And it says in Philippians 2, 5 to 7, your attitude should be the same that Christ Jesus had, that though he was God, he did not demand and cling to his rights as God. He made himself nothing. He took the humble position of a slave and appeared in human form. And, and this is how I see this problem manifesting in the family of God, a problem that's not unique to our church. It's not unique to the South Coast churches. It's, a, it's across the globe. It's like a wedge being put in between all the, the churches. It's a wedge being put into the family of God. And it's not a problem that I can fix, unfortunately. It's not a problem that Trev can fix or Jeff or any of the pastors. It's not a problem that the leadership can fix. It's a problem that each of us sitting here has to commit ourselves to fixing. As Trevor has said many times, the church is called to be that bridge. Remember, he talks about it often, that the church is the bridge that we're holding God's hand and we're holding the community's hand, because that's all what we told you, and we're there to join those two hands together. Have you heard him say that before? And I just have this fear that us as a church is not holding God's hand too well. And how are we going to join God's hand to the lost world if we ourselves are not holding that hand? And it's all about coming back to our first love. Coming back to first love. Uh, last week, uh, we had such a great sermon here by Keith West. Uh, one, such an excellent word. I felt like it was a prophetic word. I felt like it, it spoke to me. It spoke about revival. It spoke about reviving us. Do, do you remember what, what he said last week? And it really just struck some nerves, and I've been meditating on it. I've been chatting to people about it. And one thing I've learned is what's on your heart, you better preach. So when this whole week I've been thinking about this, when I came time to preach, I thought I've got to preach on this. Finding one's first love. And our reading is in Revelation chapter 2, and it was written by a guy named John, who many agree that he was the Apostle John, and he was in prison on the island in Patmos, and uh, he was given many visions direct from Jesus to write to the various churches. And uh, we're going to read the one he wrote to a church in Ephesus. Ephesus. This city was one of the largest and the most important in the ancient Mediterranean world. It was an important shipping venue. It was, it, the trade was thriving. It was a wealthy country. But morally, the city was bankrupt. One philosopher said, when he when was writing about what Ephesus was like, he said, it is, it is worthy, all the inhabitants should just drown. That's exactly the words he said. Because they are so corrupt, that it is so unclean, that this is a not a nice place morally. And it was the members of the church who was in this middle of the squalor, in the middle of what was happening. It was incredibly wealthy, but lots of stuff was happening. If you want to read about it, go read about what they were doing. Not pleasant stuff. And this was the members of these church who were also more than likely prosperous, who, who were also living in, in this place. And they were doing so much stuff right. And, and at this time, I just want you, you, you to get the humanness of this. Like we sometimes read the Bible and think that it's just words. But there's people behind these words. There's real people. And I want you to get that feeling that this is a letter written to you. Just like this was written, a letter written to the elders of Ephesus at that time. And just think about what it must have felt like. Put the humanness into it. Put the emotion into it. So let's read Revelation chapter 2. To the angel of the church in Ephesus writes, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and 
your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Let's drop right there for just a bit. I know if I was receiving a letter like this and I was sitting at, at a table and this letter was being written, I would have started patting myself on the back right now. This sounds like a church has got it all together, hasn't it? This church is on point in many aspects of feeding the poor. Possibly, uh, they're possibly being persecuted. We, we say they, they're very discerning. Uh, I imagine they had life groups. I imagine they had wonderful soup kitchens. I reckon they had an amazing youth that was on fire for God. I, I think their kids' ministry was next level. They, they had prayer. They had support groups. There was a congregation who were generous and got involved and stuck in, in all aspects of ministries. But, but, verse 4, Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I'll come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. That's a little bit of a, a, a complete swing around. They've been talking how great this church and how wonderful this church is doing, and then it ends off with that statement. Pride definitely comes just before that fall, and uh, you could just always see them getting puffed up, and then this blow comes in. And this wasn't a blow from a disgruntled church member. This wasn't a, a, a blow from someone that uh, didn't matter. This was a blow direct from Jesus, which makes it even more frightening, doesn't it? Direct from, some, from Jesus. And the question was simple, and it's still the same 2,000 plus years later. Do you love me? Jesus is asking us this today. Jesus is asking us all the simple question. Do you love me? Do you remember when he asked Peter that question? Peter was his most devoted and passionate disciple. He gave up his business and family, left it all, followed Jesus. He had faith like no other disciple. He walked on water. He was the first to acknowledge him as Christ. When he, when he, went to, when he saw that transfiguration, he wanted to build a church right there. He was passionate. He was on fire. And then it says there, I will, I will never forsake you. And just before that happened, in the final act, he failed him. Peter denied Jesus three times. In Christ's darkest hour, he could not endure and overcame his own fears. Oh, how he must have wept about that. He fooled everyone, including himself, with his zeal, his devotion, and even his faith. But Jesus knew his heart, and the next time they would meet on that shore, what did he ask him? He didn't ask him, why did you reject me? Why didn't you stand up for me? Why? He didn't say any of that. All he said was, Peter, do you love me? And friends, I, I'm here to say to you now that he's asking us the same question now. The Norwegian Settlers Church, do you love me? You sitting in your seats right there, do you love me? Do you love me? And it's been really difficult for me just to, to go through that. Do we still love him? We need to start, stop lying to ourselves. First love is an amazing time. Who, who agrees with that? First love is an amazing time. Call it the honeymoon stage. Who's still in honeymoon stage here? Maybe those first, uh, first guys. Ah, I, I see that. I like to see that. How many years have you been married? 39 and still in honeymoon phase. That's what we like to hear. <laughs> We're just going to check with your wife later. <laughs> but honeymoon stage is a great time. I still remember the first time I saw my wife, Jen. I was where all good people, and young people listen to me carefully, I was where all young people should find their future spouses. 
in church. I was sitting just in front of the sound desk over there. My friends had told me I was only there because I'd searched the whole world flat and uh, I was very grateful God had closed my eyes and I found my wife in church. And I remember I was in that old church, I was as, as a closing hymn, and just I looked right, like this. And there she was, like an angel before me. <laughs> and I've not had many strong words come into my ears before. But I turned to myself, and I, and I said it to myself, because if I'd said it out loud, it would have just been a little bit creepy. I said, that's the woman I'm going to marry. And I didn't know her, I didn't know her name, didn't know anything. And then, then things started, and our relation, and we became friends, and our relationship grew. And we had those late night SMSs. We weren't in what's group group and stuff like that, but it was SMSs, where you made sure that it was under, under those characters, 160 characters, because if you go more, you've got to pay more. Do you remember those days? People don't understand how you could get so much into so little. Now we have voice notes where it's 22 minutes later and the oak's still talking. <laughs> and we had those late nights and, and, and we were so, first love is a wonderful thing, isn't it? And uh, it's a something that I ask myself, how's my first love with Jesus? Is it similar to that first love? And I'm not saying that things should still be the same, because things don't, and I get that. But how's your first love? Do you still get that excitement with your first love? Do you still get that excitement with Jesus? And I kept asking myself after last week's sermons, what are the danger signs of this happening? What, what are the danger signs that I'm losing my first love for Jesus? There must be some signs. And uh, you go Google search it and you'll get lists upon lists upon lists of different signs, and they're all good signs. And uh, I looked at all of them and, have, and eventually narrowed it down to four points and four headings. And the first one that you know you're losing your first love is you no longer want everybody to know about your God. You no longer want everybody to know about your God. Do you remember the first time you fell in love? Most people get nauseated because you can't stop talking about that person. You know, the young people are laughing because I know every conversation they have with their girlfriends about this boy, everything is about that person. We're talking, we're so focused on that person. That's all we can talk about. You let the whole world know. Imagine how my wife would say, which, uh, if I was a bit embarrassed about it and I didn't want to introduce her to anyone, it wouldn't go down well. It would end very badly for me. I think. And I see that in our Christian walk. So many of us are, are, are in the same frame of mind. Every time someone came, comes around, you should be wanting to share the gospel. You should be wanting to, to, to share the love of Jesus to them. Have you stopped telling people about your first love? Because if you've stopped telling people about your first love, there's a very good chance that you're beginning to lose your first love. The second point is, you no longer want to be in the presence of God. Jesus loved his disciples so much that the first thing he did was go and prepare a place in order to live with them one day. That's how much Jesus loves you. He says in John 14, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. People in first love, they can't stand to be apart. They find every excuse to uh, be together, don't they? First love, you just can't stand to ever be apart. Even, even a few hours is too, too much. Hence, you have very little sleep because you stay up very late talking and, and messaging and everything. And then you wake up first thing because you want to get back to your first love. Jesus loved you and I so much that he's been preparing this place for you. So one of the first signs that a Christian has left his first love is that he no longer desires to be in the presence of the love of Jesus. And we see that first in our prayer life. Beware when we start battling to pray. 
Who's ever battled to pray? I know I've battled to pray many times. Like you just sat there and you just don't know what to even say. You're battling to pray. And, and it can go one day. Sometimes you fight through it. And then there's other times that you just, you just babble and you, and you just talk. And, and you're driving in the car like I do most of it while driving. And you just talk and you babble and, you, and it's, prayer is the easiest thing in the world. Then there's other times that you just, your mind just goes in every other direction. Battling to pray, to pray is a sure sign that maybe you're losing your first love. You can continue to live as Christians for quite a while without praying. But soon your lack of fellowship with God and prayer will result in a dead, joyless relationship. Imagine in relationships now, how would they fare if you never spoke to that person? Your wife, your husband, your kids... Let's just cancel all communication from now till forever and let's stop talking. How would that relationship go? I don't think it would go too well. When it comes to fellowship with Jesus, the next thing that will suffer is church attendance. And I love that scripture that was read. Uh, it said, Hebrews 10, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habits of doing. A sure sign that you are starting to lose your first love is, a, is, is you're actually not wanting to attend churches in, church anymore. You're not wanting to gather with other believers anymore. And this will soon follow with a struggle to worship. All these things, they should be like little... Blinker signs, little lights flashing, warning signs. We need to have a check at ourselves. The next one, number three, is you no longer care about those God loves. Another warning sign that you might be leaving your first love is that you no longer care about what God cares about. Isn't that one of the biggest things about loving someone here on earth, about marriage? You care about that person. What that person loves, you love. What upsets that person, upsets you. And I'm not saying we don't get it right all the time. But that's a sure sign that you love that person. The Apostle Peter had lost his first love relationship with Jesus, and he denied him a few times. And then Jesus carried on saying to Peter that Satan wanted to sift him and try him. And, and Jesus told Peter when he, he was restored to his first love relationship to care for his sheep. Let me read John 21. It says there, When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Now Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. How we are, do we see what God sees? Do we feel what God feels? Do we see the hurts or our hearts getting callous? We don't see what we once saw. We have this, we start losing our, our, our passion for the lost. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal love. He, Jesus loved the whole world. A church or a Christian has his first love relationship with the Lord is the one who, who, who doesn't stop sharing the gospel. It's so easy to take our eyes off this thing. And this is what the church in Ephesus was in danger of doing. You, you might have all the right doctrines in place. You might have all the right things. You might be, be doing the right stuff. But if you have left the primary object of the church, you are in danger of hang, having your candlestick removed. And what is our main function? Is to reach the lost. It's the only thing that we're told to do. The Great Commission. Mark 16 said, he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. A few weeks back ago at Seoul, uh, we, we're going through the book of Acts at this moment and discussing 
uh, the early church, and it's, it's caused some great discussions, heated discussions, some disagreements. It's been f- lots of fun. We, we went through something called the seven toxic, toxic statements of a church, and uh, I asked the leadership, uh, we should send this out as a survey to our church, and uh, they weren't uh, too impressed. They thought it might cause a bit of eruption. But uh, if you want to Google it, go Google it. Say seven deadly statements of a church congregant. And uh, it's uh, interesting what they have to say there. And uh, it got us so fired up on the different stuff. And, uh, but one of the things we carried on, and, and one that we did two weeks ago, three weeks ago, I can't remember exactly, was we were asked to share a to give an account of the last time we shared our faith. So I I should have maybe prepared a little bit more and uh, made sure that I had gone and shared my faith recently. And suddenly we're going around the room. Everyone needs to share, when last did you share your faith? And the embarrassing realization when it was coming up to my turn and I suddenly realized, I can't even remember last time I shared my faith. Last time I I told them, do you know Jesus? It was an embarrassing moment for me. And it should be a warning light that that starts telling you, are you losing your first love? This shouldn't be something that we should even be thinking about. We should be struggling to remember all the people because there's so many people. It's more about giving a long list. It's a good test. Maybe it's a good test for us right now. Close your eyes, everyone, close your eyes quickly. Think about the last time you shared your faith. If you can't think of a time, there's a warning light. Think about how you did it. Think about how you prayed for that person. Think about the time you last shared your faith. Right, open your eyes before you fall asleep. It's a scary realization, and it's an easy test, isn't it? It's something that we could do every week, every month. Right, Lord, let me write down a list of people that I've shared my faith with. We're a little bit in the habit of saying, they will know that I'm a Christian. They'll know. I don't have to say anything. They will know. Well, unfortunately, there's a lot of good people out there that aren't Christians. And as Angus Buchan keeps saying, good people don't get to heaven, only believers. So there's lots of good people. Being good is not good enough. The next point, number four, is you no longer put God's will before your own will. That's a sure sign that maybe you're losing your first love. When you start worried more about what I do than what, and what my wants are and what what's what serves my agenda than what serves God's agenda. When we fall in love for the first time, we, we want, we no longer, you know, what we want no longer matters. Was it just me? When we started going out, I didn't care what movie we went to, as long as we went to a movie together. I didn't care what restaurant we, we went to. You know, remember that old advert, the roller advert? You, it's my last roller, but you can have it. Do you remember those adverts? And uh, when you're in first in love and you love this person, that last roller is not even a question. Yeah, you can have the last roller. And Jesus is asking us the same today. Can I have your last roller? Can I have your first roller? Can I have all your rollers? Matthew 6, to 34 says, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. We completely lose sight of our own wants and desires when we're putting Jesus first. When when we first got saved, we were all about God's will, weren't we? I remember that time. Every little decision, I came before God in prayer. Every little thing that I wanted to say or do, and then slowly... I get quite competent at making decisions. And all of a sudden, I'm not bringing everything to God in prayer like I once did. My prayer life was there, but I wasn't asking those questions. So 
So it's been a bit of a bad news day, hasn't it? Some soul searching stuff. Someone asked me today, so, are you going to hit? I think on Ange, I think you asked me, are we going to hit us with a big stick? I said, you have no idea. You have no idea about the sour stick that you're going to get hit with today. But there's an exciting, there's a way back. There's a great way back. Jesus is a God of second chances. Who, put up your hands if you enjoy that Jesus is a God of second chances. All right, who's messed up before? Who's never messed up? Uh, just, just checking. God is a God of second chances, and it's a great thing. Jesus told the church in verse 5, Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. It's easy. The remedy is easy. Remember, repent, and return. Three R's. Trevor would be proud of me right now. Remember, repent, and return. The first thing you have to do is remember from where you have fallen. This church in Ephesus, in, in spite of everything that it had gone for it, had fallen. They'd fallen away. They'd fell from their position. Jesus told this church to remember from where they'd fallen. Remember. Remember what your relationship was once like. Do you remember the day that the Lord saved you? Do you remember how on fire you were? Do you remember how close you felt? One tendency that humans seem to share is the tendency to forget. This can be seen especially in children. And I've got four boys, so I can see it very clearly. And on Christmas Day, their eyes are all a sparkle, or their birthday, and there's presents. And this present gets unwrapped, and it is the most amazing thing that they've ever seen. Three days later, if it's not broken, it's been shoved under the bed, it's been left outside, it's no longer holds that same, that same attraction that was when it was in that wrapper and was still new. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And we have a feeling of, of forgetting where we've come from as well. We need to remember where we've come from. Remember how we were. I was listening to a good sermon the other day and, and uh, the guy said, Repeat after me, I am a sinner. And the whole congregation, there must have been a thousand, two thousand people, and they say, I am a sinner. And uh, then he said, Turn to the person next to you and say, You are nasty. He said, And turn to the right and say, You are as bad to the bone. But we, we forget this. We forget how bad we are. We forget where we've come from. We, we get so puffed up by our good works and what we do, we, we forget. And, and we need to remember where God has lifted us up from. We need to remember, for all have sinned. Have you ever noticed that you sometimes take action towards what you want? Like when you really want something, and I've, I've been seeing it with my kids, when they're really focused on something that they want, they will move heaven and earth to get there. And sometimes our problem is that we're not focused on what we want. We need to be focused on our first love with Christ. In Luke 15, when we read about the prodigal son who left home, spent all that he had, eventually was in the, in the pigs. And what did he do? It says there, he remembered. He remembered. He remembered how good it was in his father's house. He remembered how the servants even had something to eat. He remembered all those things. And when he remembered how it was, it got him moving in that direction. Got him running back to his father. And that's the time. God still is the same God now. He still wants you to come back. Don't forget. Remember that you were once nobody. And God made you a somebody. Remember that you were once lost, but God found you. Remember that you were on your way to hell, but God saved you and gave you a place with him. We need to remember the next thing that uh, after you've remembered, we need to repent. Though some have had a hard time believing that the church ever has to repent about anything, and there's a, that's incorrect, because right here we told, this church was told to repent. 
and they told him to repent. Now remember, this was a dynamic church. This was a dedicated, determined, discerning, disciplined. Again, Trevor would be proud of me. This was a great church. But they had lost that passion they once had for God, that passion. Even though they may go through all the right motions, when, when we leave the first love, it doesn't take long until it becomes a task and not a joy. We've spoken about it a lot uh, to friends, and, and God wants you to serve out of a place of rest. This should be the easiest thing in the world for you to serve in this church, to serve in the body. Yeah, there's tough times and there's hard times, but nothing that's lacquer is easy, is it? We need to really just find the joy in serving. And we need to repent because going through the motions will never be enough to please God. If we are not burning with the passion of Christ, we'd better look and see what is wrong. And Christ said to the church, repent. They needed to change their attitude towards Christ and resume their first love, renew themselves again in his presence. I want you to make sure you understand this. He wasn't talking to the lost. This wasn't the lost that he was talking to, Church of Ephesus. He was talking to his church. What's the greatest commandment? Jesus said, what's the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. Sometimes we get so stuck on sin being what we do. But I feel some of the greatest sins we commit is what we don't do. And what's the greatest sin, I believe, because that's what the greatest commandment is? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and mind. So what's the greatest sin? Not loving the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. Bigger than any other sin that you can think of. Which uh, we have this human tendency of ranking sin, don't we? We enjoy putting it bad, not so bad, gray, iffy. The greatest sin is not loving God with all your heart and soul and mind. We need to repent. And then finally, we need to return. Notice that Christ called for action upon the part of the church. You see, love is more than just a good feel of, of good hope, hope or emotion. It's a commitment. Marriage counselors will often tell you is how to restore marriages is, is, is to go back and remember what you did at first. Remember how you bought flowers for your wife. Remember how you used to open the door. Remember, and, and counselors will often say, go back and just remember what you did and do it again. Return. Do it all again. And one way of returning is returning to how you used to do things uh, or, or how maybe you used to worship. An emphasis in the early church was, which was again in Ephesus, and we read about it in Acts 19. It says, and they were known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus, and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. The name of the Lord was magnified. Do we still revere the Lord like we used to? Do we still worship like we used to? Psalm 145 verse 3 says, Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and the greatness is unsearchable. And I'm going to call the worship team up shortly, and I hope we are going to worship like none of us have worshipped in some time. We need to first remember where Jesus has lifted us from the squalor that we were in. We need to repent for what we are doing and not doing. How we've lost our first love and got so busy with doing the right stuff. And God says, I don't care about that stuff. I want your heart. We need to worship the King of Kings with all our hearts, our souls and mind. When we were first in love, we didn't care what people said about us or how we acted. On my wedding day, I remember singing. Can you believe it? I sang on my own. No, no accompaniment. Can you picture that? I, then I remember leopard crawling across the whole dance floor to my wife. Because my friend said, that's what I need to do. So I did it to show them how much I love her. I don't do those things anymore. I should let me crawl a little bit more, I guess. 
David, when he, when he, he went down the, down the streets dancing in his underpants. Now, please, when you worship now, no one take your pants off. Please. But we need to worship God with that same heart, with that same abandonment. Don't care what people, if you're called to go on your knees, you go on your knees. If you're called to, to dance, you dance. If you're called to, to just worship the Lord, because that's all we want to do. We want to worship the Lord as we're called to. Not caring what people think. Because that's what our first love is all about, isn't it? It's not about caring about what other people think and whatever people might say and what might happen. We need to worship our God. Let us pray. Lord, you know how our hearts, and you're asking the same question now, do you love me? You already know the answer. And still we try and convince you otherwise. We can't hide the fact to you. I can, I can fool my colleagues. I can fool my families. I can fool my friends. But I can't fool you about the state of my heart, whether you are number one, whether you are right up there, that I don't do these things for any other reason but because I love you so, so much. And as we go into this time of worship now, Lord, I, I pray that you would just place in everyone's heart that they would remember how they once did, that they would remember the love they once had, and that they would come back and, and, and come back into putting you as first. And I just want to close as, in the same way Paul closed to the Ephesians and he says, for this reason, I kneel before the Father from where, whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in his inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long, and high, and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. In your precious name, amen.